Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar and panel discussion. With that, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our three panelists, Dr. Giulio Fermenti, Dr. Shilpa Garg, and Alex McIntosh today. We will start off with each of them giving a brief talk about their research and then move on to the panel discussion. Before we dive into that, I just wanna share a little bit about what makes a really good genome assembly and how ARIMA technology can help scientists achieve this level of assembly. Ultimately, a good genome assembly comes down to accurately representing every base in the genome, containing all of the genes completely, phasing those sequences into their parental haplotypes and anchoring them into chromosomes. Now, accuracy and completeness are primarily determined at the contig level by sequencing technology, but phasing and um, anchoring those contigs into chromosomes can really only be achieved through scaffolding technology. So how does a technology like arima High c aid in genome assembly? Well, we all know that there have been many advances in DNA sequencing technology over the last decade, and technologies are now able to deliver long, accurate contigs. Uh, but unfortunately, sequencing technologies alone are not good enough to deliver um, a complete genome anchored into chromosomes. So you wind up with hundreds to thousands of unmapped contigs. You then need a scaffolding technology uh, to anchor those contigs into chromosomes and give you that complete genome assembly uh, to hopefully give you all of the biological insights you've been hoping to get from this assembly. So I've told you about scaffolding, which can really fall into two parts, ordering and orienting contigs, and then anchoring those contigs into chromosomes. Uh, but there are four ways that HiC data um, can be used to improve genome assemblies. The third one is, which I believe uh, Dr. Garg will tell us a little bit about today, is fixing misassemblies and identifying structural variation, as well as phasing haplotypes. Now, we are at an ARIMA webinar, so I just want to tell you briefly how um, ARIMA High c for Genome Assembly can help you. Um, luckily, there is no special equipment needed. Um, you, we offer um, easy to use High c kits that integrate seamlessly with your existing sequencing pipelines. We also provide end-to-end -end service to help you go from sample to data analysis quickly and easily if you prefer that option. Just to share three of the reasons why our customers really like working with ARIMA technology. Firstly, we have um, highly flexible sample type and input requirements. Our data is also compatible with all of the latest, greatest um, assembly and scaffolding pipelines, so you're not tied to using one specific pipeline. And lastly, our science-first approach to working with our customers. Hopefully today's webinar inspires you to uh, want to try out ARIMA High c for your genome assemblies. And we currently have a grant open. Uh, two winners will be selected to each receive an eight reaction sample prep and library prep bundle. And applications are open until October 14th. And you can either scan this QR code or go to arimagenomics.com slash genome dash grant in order to apply. Okay, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Giulio Fermenti, who is a postdoc in the Jarvis Lab at the Rockefeller University and serves as the bioinformatics lead for the Vertebrate Genomes Project. Today, he will be sharing um, how he sees high quality genomes as ushering in a new era of biology. Giulio, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Pamela and the rest of the ARIMA team for the kind invitation. I will start by saying that, of course, it's really important to uh, get these sequences uh, for uh, studying uh, the organisms we're interested in. That was um, acknowledged already in the, in the 80s by Frederick Sanger. And uh, it's clear now that uh, this is possible. This is something we can do for most of the species. And uh, that is why there are many, many uh, initiatives around the world that are trying to generate high quality reference genomes for, uh, for the species they're interested in. Uh, some of these initiatives are national, some are regional, so they're focused on a particular area. 
or in a particular uh, country. Some others are more interested in uh, phylogenetic uh, questions, so they are looking uh, to uh, the specific taxa. Uh, one of these initiatives is the uh, Vertebrate uh, Genomes Project. That's what I work on here at the Rockefeller University. And the Vertebrate Genomes Project is an international initiative with uh, three main hubs. One is uh, the Vertebrate Genome Lab here at, uh, in New York. The other one is the Wellcome uh, Sanger Institute in the UK and the Max Planck in Dresden. But we also have a network of collaborators all over the world. And what we're uh, targeting here is, of course, vertebrates, and particularly all vertebrates in the long term, where we're trying to achieve this in phases, where are uh, towards um, the completion of phase one at this point, representing all vertebrate orders with a high quality reference genome. And then we'll uh, start targeting um, families, genera, and eventually all the species. How we achieve this, uh, throughout the years, we have uh, uh, developed uh, uh, several pipelines for genome assembly, and we have updated them, upgraded them as the data uh, also changed over time. Here you can see the latest iteration of this pipeline. Uh, there are a few uh, different sequencing technologies involved. As you can see, one of them is the high C from, uh, from Arima. We usually uh, build the backbone of context, uh, as uh, Amila was saying, using hi-fi reads uh, from PacBio. Uh, and then, uh, yes, we do need uh, additional information to actually be able to uh, generate a final chromosome level assembly for, for this genomes. So um, you can see here highlighted where we're actually integrating the high C information. There are two steps. Uh, one is for the phasing, as uh, uh, Pamela briefly mentioned. The other one, which we'll talk about uh, first, is the uh, scaffolding. So how we basically orient uh, these contexts uh, into a final uh, sequence that represents the entire chromosome. Uh, just to highlight briefly how this works, so you can see that we have different nodes we can run our pipeline regular mode, it means that we usually don't have IC information for that particular sample. But what we actually do now is generate IC data for a marina for all the samples. So we don't actually run that very often. Uh, then we have this high C mode where we can actually integrate directly in the assembly graph the IC data, and that's really helpful to uh, resolve uh, the haplotypes. Uh, sometimes it's possible to have parental data. I would say this is still the best possible way to fully resolve haplotypes, though you will see also in a second. Uh, and, uh, but of course, in many cases, particularly when we're uh, thinking about non-model species, that's not really possible. Uh, and then we go through a few steps of scaffolding, again, to reconstruct the um, entire um, chromosome um, from the context. Uh, we also have a step of decontamination, mitochondrial assembly, and manual curation, which is also very important. So how does the scaffolding process work using high c uh, briefly? So, um, you know, we have a set of chromosomes that we want to reconstruct. They are usually packed in the nucleus. And every IC read that we generate actually refers to two particular genome locations that indicate that there is a special interaction between these two genome locations. The reasons for that is because if you think about the, the nucleus and the chromosomes within it, you can imagine them like almost like galaxies that are uh, very uh, far away from each other. So they're really separated from each other. So when you prepare a high IC, IC library, which uh, involves the um, um, uh, cutting the DNA and then relegating the DNA uh, so that it cross links and creates new contacts, you usually these contacts will uh, be part of the same chromosome. So the high C will then measure the interaction frequency between loci that are usually located within the same chromosomes at a certain distance. And then the number of paired reads that link any two particular regions in the reference genome can be computed. And essentially, this is what it's going to look like. So the loci that reside in the same chromosome, like this one up here, will have higher interaction frequency, as represented by the high C map here. And there is a distance-dependent decay, which you can appreciate also in this picture uh, of, uh, of the interaction. So this pattern has essentially um, creating it uh, is, is providing us with information on how we can actually reconstruct the chromosome. So for instance, you can see down here, there is a, a tiny bit that seems to be interacting with this larger bit. And this is a strong indication that actually this bit was not placed uh, yet in the chromosome it belongs to. 
So uh, how this is done in practice, there were a few tools mentioned in the, in the survey. Uh, here I mentioned a couple that are very popular, Salsa2 and YAS. More recently, they rely on high C data to actually correct misassemblies in the input context, and then they can orient and order them using uh, an algorithm. And the, the basic principle is that you measure these contacts between different regions of the chromosomes, and based on the strong uh, strength of the interaction, which you can see, here uh, depicted with uh, uh, these edges connecting the nodes, you can decide how to linearize uh, the, uh, the, the graph of the interactions into a final uh, reconstructed uh, sequence for each chromosome. Uh, like I said, we have another step where we're actually using this information. Uh, this is uh, at the very beginning to try to separate the haplotypes. I'm sure uh, Shilpa will talk about more about this, but I would just want to share with you the kind of results that we usually uh, get at this point. So this is our um, beloved zebrafinch, one of the model species that we use in the lab. And here you can see plot that describes how well the haplotypes that of the deep, these diploid organisms have been reconstructed using high phiasm and high C integration. So the first plot here on the left, you have the colors that represent essentially the two haplotypes. You can see uh, because uh, of the many contexts that la la lay on the diagonal, you can see that there is still a mixture of, of haplotypes. Uh, with you, as I was mentioning before, when you have parental data, so in this process of uh, so-called three binning, you can actually fully separate two haplotypes. Uh, but uh, what has been uh, extremely uh, advantageous recently is that uh, algorithmic development uh, allowed us also to take advantage of high C information and integrate this high C information in the graph to achieve something that is, as you can see, very close to pre opening So the, the chromosomes will still uh, not be, of course, partitioned in the two haplotypes because we don't know uh, in which haplotype they originally uh, were inherited from. But essentially, within the same chromosome, uh, this, the phasing will be uh, almost complete, which is uh, really impressive, but really useful also to uh, fix many of the errors that we can usually find uh, in, in chromosomes. Um, so, the, by the way, I, I forgot to mention this before, but the assembly pipeline that we use is also available in, in a, a, a public infrastructure for compute called Galaxy. So, uh, mm, you have the link down here. If you want, you don't need any computer resources or programming skills. You can actually run this with your own data sets. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, this is a, uh, a picture from a, a paper that we published this year as part of the European Reference Genome Atlas Consortium that is uh, one of these large scale initiatives to uh, generate reference genomes uh, for, for a lot of species, in this case, for all European species. And here you can see the many applications, the potential that, that generating reference genomes has for uh, biology. So, of course, we're interested uh, in regenerating high quality, complete and accurate, as Pamela was saying, genomes, because that's the, really the only way to be able to study many uh, complex features uh, in the genomes, like segmental duplication, centromere repeats, telomeres, satellites, uh, inversions that can, uh, you know, uh, span megabases within chromosomes, mobile elements, of course, the, the, the single nucleotide polymorphisms and copy number uh, variants, but um, also non-coding regulatory regions. And all this information can be used then to try to understand uh, the uh, level of inbreeding of a species, the presence of deleterious mutations, uh, whether also outbreeding uh, could also be a problem for, for conservation or integration, uh, the, these, uh, the effects of these uh, phenomena on uh, the particular species that we're interested in. Uh, of course, local adaptation, uh, phylogenomics, that's what, uh, for instance, for the BGP people are uh, very interested in, and in general for um, community biomonitoring, which is uh, at present in, in the current situation, let's say, uh, a very, very important issue. So I will finish with a few examples um, that um, really showcase uh, the power of reference genomes for, for this kind of a, um, studies. And uh, this has been uh, reviewed by me and others as part of the uh, ERGA effort. Uh, it's uh, currently under review, but hopefully will be available soon with uh, more details. But I will just uh, give you a few um, right now. So 
Uh, one of the first uh, species where uh, we can see a demonstration of our reference genomes uh, of um, you know, chromosomal level uh, can actually be useful is the Atlantic cod, cod where uh, essentially there are several uh, cryptic ecotypes. And this was uh, um, really the first mammal organism with a chromosomal anchored genome assembly. And um, it was seen essentially that there are four large chromosomal inversions that can actually be used to discriminate between the migratory and non-migratory ecotypes in the region and Iceland waters. So again, one example, uh, one, one striking example of the importance of having chromosomal level uh, reference genomes. Another example is the ocean crab. The horseshoe crab, um, uh, you know, is a very fascinating species. And recently, there has been uh, an effort to generate three uh, genomes for it. Uh, and what has been observed is that there have been three rounds of whole genome duplication in the genome. And I, I think you can easily see why then having a high quality reference genomes is, is key to understand the evolution of these complex uh, genomes, um, including also uh, extensive tandem duplications. Uh, and particularly this time of duplication seems to be implicated in the, in the immune system of ocean crabs. So again, how we can really understand the biology of these organisms through genomics, we need this kind of uh, information. Um, the ash dieback, that's actually uh, a, a fungal pathogen that uh, affects uh, ash trees and it started to spread across Europe in the 90s. Uh, and uh, what has been uh, shown, again, using uh, genomic tools is that uh, in particular in, in Denmark, um, forestry germplasm um, uh, was uh, used to identify individuals that have reduced susceptibility to that particular uh, pathogen. So uh, another area for, for a lot of them, important investigation. Yet another example, that's the European beach. Uh, and I think uh, if you're living in Europe, you may be familiar with this. In the summers between the 2018 and 19, about two thirds of European beach trees were damaged or killed by extreme drought. Uh, but all, again, similarly to the uh, ash trees, not all of them respond in the same way. And it's been shown that actually this is uh, mostly uh, correlated with their, um, uh, with their genome. Uh, the burial links. The burial links uh, is one of the first whole genome sequences that are in highly uh, endangered species and was one of the first examples where uh, we could study uh, the purging of highly endothelial variants uh, that essentially occur, so regions of high homozygosity. Um, and also, we could also uh, test the hypothesis uh, on uh, the presence of potentially deleterious variation in this um, highly inbred. Uh, population, uh, and there were um, a lot of studies uh, around this uh, problem uh, to essentially then be able to monitor and manage the genetic diversity uh, in, uh, you know, an ex situ or remnant or introduced populations. Similarly, in the case of the Florida uh, panther, that's uh, early 90s, uh, it's a species of puma that lives in the Big Cypress National Preserve, and it's shown low reproductive success and multiple signs of inbreeding. And again, was one of the first and now of the many actually examples uh, of um, um, uh, long uh, tracks of homozygosity despite recent outbreeding that could actually uh, still be able to cope uh, with, uh, with environmental challenges. Uh, other examples are the vaquita or the kakapo that we also worked on in the BGP. Uh, finally, uh, there are relatively few chromosomal level uh, reference genomes available for non-model uh, invertebrates. Uh, and one recent example uh, is in uh, is a freshwater sponge that was uh, generated recently and published. And actually now it's been used to explore selection and adaptation in sponges. Uh, finally, I would say, because again, that's not something that was available uh, until recently. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank particularly uh, my colleagues here at the Vertebrate Genome Lab and also uh, all the people that are contributing to the BGP, the European Reference Genome Atlas, uh, Galaxy, the um, computational infrastructure I mentioned before, uh, the Rockwell University and our um, funding agency. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Julio. Um, the breadth of species you're working with is really incredible. Um, so thank you for sharing those with us. 
Okay, now moving on to our next speaker um, who needs very little introduction in the genome assembly space, but Dr. Shilpa Garg is an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen, where she develops algorithms to solve fundamental biological challenges of genome assembly haplotyping, identifying uh, structural variants, um, and today she's going to share some of her work with us on generating haplotype resolved genome assemblies and pan genomes. Thanks, Pamela, and thanks everyone for joining today. So I'll give you, I'm Shilpa Garg, I'll give you some of the latest uh, bioinformatic methods for assembling chromosome scale haplotype soil genomes, also pan genomes. So I'll start with the very basics. Like as we know, different species have different set of chromosomes and each chromosome has their own copies. For example, in a diploid genome, you see two of them and it can be polyploid. And the recent advances in sequencing technologies as for example, especially the high C technologies and more long reads have given us enormous opportunities to produce these genomes directly from the reads. And these, as Julio has already demonstrated that these chromosomal level assemblies are very important if we want to study evolution, biology, and also any genomic diversity across tree of life. And also it's important in the human space to study the causes of disease. So I will not, I will skip the technology part of HiC given that uh, Julie has already covered. So I'll, I'll move toward, move towards the more the methods computational side of it. So, so as we know, assembling genomes is not a new problem. It started with a human genome project because at that time, that was a big uh, initiative to assemble the genome. And we started with the short reads and, in the, and then you represent the short reads in the form of a graph. So it could be a debridging graph or an overlap graph. Essentially in an overlap graph, each node is a read and the connections are the overlaps between reads. But imagine if a genome has many repetitive sequences, like for example, humans or even some of vertebrates, um, then you cannot assign uniquely, especially the short reads to a specific repeat. So in that case, the graphs look tangled like this, but then we move towards the long reads and they have the ability to span these repetitive regions and then the, the graph looks less tangled. For example, you see the graphs dramatically improved and thus we can get continuous sequences. So with some advances in the technology and also the algorithms, so we were finally able to finish the first human genome, which is end-to-end. But the limitation here is this genome still don't represent the true characteristics of a genome because, um, for example, the human is diploid. Similarly, other organisms, some of them are diploid or polyploid. So at this stage, we what we produce is a collapse haplotype sequence. So there have been some uh, advances to actually produce the haplotype aware genome assembly on the chromosome level, but some of them made use of TRIO information, which limit its applications because TRIOs are not readily available. And then some of the other methods, they are either based on um, these long erroneous repeats. So to overcome these limitations, actually, uh, we for the first time proposed this unique idea, which is uh, to use phasing information directly in the overlapping step. Uh, for example, when we find the overlaps between the reads, we find this SNP variation in that. And if the character on the SNP is same, for example, if it's gray and gray hair, then it's the same haplotype. And if it's yellow and yellow, then it's these reads belong to the other. And now we encode this phasing information right in the graph uh, step. So now here each read each node is a reed hair and connections are the haplotype specific overlaps. And then you start to see some beautiful structures in the graph that are 
actually represents a true genomic characteristics, for example, structure variations. But now these long reads, although they have become accurate and longer, but they are not long enough to span the, all the repetitive regions of the genome that end up producing some contains. So, but what we are interested in is to produce chromosome level sequences. So therefore we propose this workflow for the first time, like the integration of long reads as well and the high C data. So first we take these contexts and then scaffold these contexts using high C to get these, to find the right orientation and the ordering of the contexts. And then we get these sequences that are actually on the chromosome level. And then further we map the reads and call these SNPs and use the um, high C and long reads, both of them together to partition the reads to two sets. And this workflow is actually designed for the deployed genome specifically. So that's why we make two partitions. And these partitions, they are on the chromosome. And then we remap the reads. We finally assemble these sep partitions separately and get the haplotypes. And then for the human genomes, we observed that we could do this whole process within a day, which previously used to take um, like several weeks. This was basically due to the advances in the technologies, especially high C and long accurate reads, uh, and also these new algorithms. So, so here we actually applied this workflow on HC002, which is public, widely used. Uh, genome. And here in this panel, you see that each color in a panel represents the phasing segment. And ideally, if we want to see the haplotypes on the chromosome level, we would like to see one color through the whole chromosome. So here, when we combine high C and high phi, we for the first time could produce the chromosome haplotypes as demonstrated in this panel that we could see one red color through the whole chromosome. And then we also evaluated using other standard metrics, like for example, now the total genome size is three gigabases, each haplotype for the human. And then we can, phasing error rates are like less than half a percent. And we can uh, phase um, a more than uh, like more than 95% of the genome. And we, we performed these experiments initially on the healthy humans, which are purely deployed. And then we also excite, got excited about this, like to go beyond in the human health space to look into more complex genomes that as we know, cancer genomes are highly complex where the mutation starts from one cell and then it may proliferate to millions of cells. So we took this melanoma cancer cell line and sequence with HIFI and HIC in collaboration with Arima Genomics to about 40x coverage each. And then we applied our, we channelized our workflow to this, for this complex uh, uh, genomes. And then we call, used this method to call the somatic structure variations um, in melanoma cancer. So in this plot, on the x-axis, you see the different repeat elements, and on the y-axis, you see the consistency of our call set with other three, four call sets that are available from different sources. For example, one is from New York Genome Center, another is from Netherlands Group, which is short read based, and then there is another call set, which is single cell based. So here, if we look if we observe closely, then this red bar which is like more than 90%. So our calls were consistent with the single cell based uh, calls. And then there are some calls, especially there are these green ones that are novel that were missed by the short route technologies. And then there are uh, two or 3% that we have missed in our call set that may be probably due to the, um, due to, the variants that have low variant allele frequency. Uh, then we also looked at some of the more clinically relevant regions like HLA. As we know, HLA 
um, has some repeats, for example, a few tens of bases repeating thousand times, especially if you see this DRB1, DQA1, DQB. And we took our assemblies, we aligned to the reference genome. And here in this panel, you see the darker the color is, higher is the divergence of these sequences to the reference. So now we observe that if now there is a variation even between the haplotypes in a, within the same sample. So this variation we can only study if we could able to assemble the chromosome scale haplotype resolved genome property. So now it has come possible to even reconstruct these clinically relevant regions. And then it would be interesting to see if these structure variations have some associations to like there is a if these structure variations are in a promoter region, it, it's affecting the downstream phenotype. Next, beyond human health, we were also interested in some of the biodiversity as biodiversity is most, one of the most basic um, uh, processes to understand the life on the planet. So we, we have been collaborating closely with Darwin Tree of Life and other large scale initiatives uh, on the biodiversity domain. So we have assembled a few more genomes using these methods. And we observed that there's some of these genomes have highly heterozygosity, high heterozygosity rates. And we observed that we can even assemble these genomes fine based on these standard evaluation methods within several hours now. So next, once we have, we can assemble these genomes separately, how can we leverage this new um, advances in genomics to also study in the comparative genomics. So this is why we put up this perspective, which is, uh, and we form this chromosome scale haplotype resolved pan genomics. Essentially, you you embed different genomes in a one graph space, and then the common sequences are here. And then whatever differences that can be within the genome or across genomes uh, that can be represented by different alleles or the paths in these bubbles. And this also helps to, you can also encode this complex structure variation in the graph next year. So pan genomics enables this S3 discovery and also their associated functional role by using the HiC data. Next to to scale up these pan-genomic efforts, imagine to enable biologists to use these pan-genomics uh, in a more routine fashion. Here we proposed a new hierarchical approach. For example, you are given this taxonomy, class, genus, and species, and you have the representative sequence at different resolution. So we, we propose a hierarchical approach that instead of putting up all the structure variations, any variation in just one graph, we propose a hierarchical approach that allows biologists flexibility as well as um, they can access a graph at any uh, resolution in a tree of life. For example, you can be, we have this subgraph first at the class level. So there is a, these sequences that are similar and then these differences, they are, forming these bubbles here. So we have subgraphs at different levels now, classes, genus, and species. And then the interactions between these subgraphs, they are maintained by these interlevel connections. So the advantage of this approach is that, like you can only save this graph in the memory and then access it using different hashing techniques. But the disadvantage of this approach is that in case you have a species that is highly divergent from the given set of uh, taxon, for example, 90%. So in that case, this approach may fail for now. So this we are already applying to the rice pan genomics where there are different types of species cultivated wild and how, which haplotypes to use for breeding to be associated for the uh, to find associations to to the different environmental stressors under the climate change era. 
so with this, I would like to conclude my talk. So here I have given you some of the recent advances in the computational method, especially, and, and how you can integrate the long read, accurate read, and high C to produce chromosome scale haplotype world assembly and also pan genomic. And I've given you demonstrated this method you on some some of the initially some of this uh, healthy diploid genomes and then also the cancer uh, genomics to find structure variation. And then I have um, shown you an approach to, to leverage these um, new genomes for sustainable production. So yeah, as a nutshell, we are, we are excited in this new era of chromosome scale assemblies where we can combine these diverse forms of data sets um, in a unique fashion that, that is, and to yield meaningful in, insights that can help precision medicine and understanding of uh, complex diseases and biodiversity. And I would like to thank my group members and collaborators and our funding agencies. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Shilpa, for that talk. It's honestly just breathtaking how um, applicable um, all of these assemblies and tools that you're developing are. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, with that, um, it's now my pleasure to last but not least introduce Alex McIntosh. He is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh uh, studying population genomics of interchromosomal rearrangements. And today he's going to share how having a high quality assembly um, helped him better understand butterfly evolution and speciation. Alex, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, hello everyone. As Pamela said, I'm Alex, a PhD student in Edinburgh. And I'll talk to you today about my research. And what I hope to convince you of is that having just one or maybe two or more really good assemblies for your organisms of interest can allow you to learn a lot about evolution. And in my case, chromosome evolution and speciation. And so I'll start by uh, introducing lepidoptera and chromosomes. That's what I'm, what I'm focused on in my PhD. The lepidoptera are moth and butterflies. And here I'm showing a comparison between the genomes of the diamondback moth Clutella xylostella and the peacock butterfly Aglaes eo. And what this figure here shows is Aglaes eo chromosomes on top and Clutella xylostella chromosomes on the bottom. And the lines connecting them connect the same single copy ortholog in either genome. And even though these two species are diverged by well over 100 million years. They share chromosomes. They share the same set of 31 chromosomes, and there's really very little evidence for any uh, large rearrangements, in particular fissions and fusions, despite a bit of background noise. And this is generally the case in Lepidoptera. But what I'm interested in is an exception to this rule, and that is found in the genus Brentus. And there are other genera around or in the Lepidoptera like this, but this is the one I'm working on. And these are butterflies with unusual karyotypes, not the standard 31. So Brentus Daphne and Brentus Eno have 12 to 14 chromosomes. And the next lineage out, Brentus Hecate, has 34. And these are all, yeah, as I said, unusual chromosome numbers and suggest there's a lot of rearrangements going on in this genus. And so to start researching what is what is happening, why or why chromosomes are evolving the way they are and what are the effects on other population level processes, we generated a genome assembly for this species, Brentus eno. And so to do that, we generated PacBio CLR data and Illumina paired end data for a single individual. And we assembled contigs, corrected consensus errors, removed contaminants, and then removed haplocytic duplications. And then we generated a REMA high C data from another individual, another male butterfly, collected from the same location. And this high C data allowed us to scaffold the contigs into 14 chromosomes. And this again is a high C map, uh, just as I think Julio showed in his slides. And the assembly is contiguous and highly accurate. And what this allows us to do now is make the same comparison I did just a few slides ago to see what is happening in the chromosomes of Brentus Eno. 
And when we make this comparison, it is it is very different to what we saw between a typical pair of moths and butterflies. So here on top are again aglase EO chromosomes, but on the bottom are Brentofino chromosomes. And again, the lines connect the same gene in either assembly. And so most Brentofino chromosomes are old chromosomes or uh, ancestral chromosomes fused together, just like here or here or here, which is a little bit more complicated. But there are also cases where ancestral chromosomes are split into multiple pieces, and now their gene content is distributed over different Brentfist chromosomes. And importantly, all these rearrangements, all this crisscrossing we can see, is derived in Brentfist. It has not happened on the lineage leading to this butterfly here. And so just from this single assembly, we, we can see that, well, there's lots and lots of fusions happening, and also a smaller number, but some uh, chromosome fissions. And I just want to go back to the slide I showed yeah, two slides ago, and focus in on this off-diagonal high C signal that maybe some of you noticed, um, it's okay if you didn't, but this actually signal might be able to tell us a bit more about chromosome evolution. Um, and I'll explain how and why, to, uh, well, now. So what is happening here is that two chromosomes or two sequences that could be assigned as chromosomes have this high C signal at one possible junction. And so one possibility is that actually, this is just one big chromosome and that the scaffolder hasn't put this together because the high C signal is just a bit, it's a bit weak. And so maybe these are large topologically associated domains where each half of the chromosome interacts physically within itself, but not between, that is one possibility. Or these are two chromosomes that share maybe some repeats at this end. And so a little bit of mismapping creates this uh, signal between them. So to investigate this further and work out what is going on, we mapped uh, standard Illumina whole genome sequence data to the assembly. And so for this chromosome, chromosome 11, we find that in males, coverage is uh, essentially, it has a normalized coverage of one, meaning that it is diploid. But in females, it has a normalized coverage of one half, so it only has one copy. And so this chromosome 11 is the Z chromosome, the Z sex chromosome. But 13, this chromosome, this has full coverage in both males and females. And so it must be an autosomal chromosome. So both sexes have two copies of this chromosome. And so this seems quite strange now that these chromosomes have different ploidy, yet there's some evidence they should be scaffolded together. So maybe this is just misassembly. Um, but we did one more thing to try and work out why there is this IC signal. And that is uh, to do similar to what Shilpa just talked about and use phase information in the high C. So we want to do is make haplotypic specific high C maps, because of course this image is the two haplotypes of this butterfly we sequence laid over one another. Uh, so it's kind of composite map, really. So what we did was call heterozygous SNPs uh, using whole genome sequence data from the same individual that we generated high C data for. Then we phase those SNPs using the high C data. And then if we go back to the high C reads, given that we have phase information for the SNPs, we can ask for a read, does it contain alleles from haplotype one? Or does it contain alleles from haplotype two? Or maybe it contains a mixture of both if it's a trans uh, contact um, or there's a sequencing error. Or maybe it contains uh, no, no heterozygous SNPs at all. But actually, heterozygosity in this genome is about 1%. So most reads can be put in either the haplotype 1 bin or the haplotype 2 bin. And these bins, reassuringly, are equally sized. And so now, with those new read sets, we can go back, map these, and make the same kind of map. And when we do this, something very, I think, very satisfying happens in that the haplotype 1 reads show that chromosomes 11 and 13 are, are separate. There's no evidence for them being physically close to one another in the cell in space. Um, and they have this quite sharp kind of bow tie here. When we look at haplotype 2, it is the opposite. And so this really has evidence that these two chromosomes in this haplotype are fused together. And so we can put uh, all this evidence together to work out what is happening. And so this butterfly 
receive the spore inherited, the Z chromosome and an autosome unfuse together as separate chromosomes from one parent, but from the other parent inherited these as a fused single chromosome. And we could call this autosome a neo-Z. And so what we've learned just from variation in this single, this single high C data set, or this single genome assembly really, is that this process of rearrangement is still ongoing in the Brentacino population because we found a rearrangement in a heterozygote state. Um, so this rearrangement hasn't fixed yet. And just with the last couple of slides, I want to talk about, yeah, some ongoing work, which really asks the question, well, if rearrangements are still happening in these butterflies, then, you know, does it matter for recent speciation? So Brentis eno, butterfly we've just, I've just talked about, uh, has a sister species, Brentis daphne, and they shared a common ancestor uh, just over two million years ago. And so if rearrangements are happening on these branches, particularly around uh, kind of split time of the ancestral population, then maybe, maybe they've played some role in speciation. And so we did exactly what we did to Brentsino and generated an assembly Brentis daphne. And so these, these species have very similar chromosome numbers, around 12 to 14 chromosomes. But actually, what we see when we compare the assemblies are cryptic rearrangements. And so here are Eno chromosomes on top, Daphne chromosomes on the bottom. And again, lines connect the same orthologous region in each of the genomes. And these chromosomes in gray are one-to-one, -one. they are orthologous. But these chromosomes over here are again shuffled, they are rearranged, they have a history of fissions and fusions. And I've colored these by how we think chromosomes were in the ancestor of Eno and Daphne. So this orange chromosome existed, we think, in the ancestor, but in Brentis Daphne, this little chunk has fused onto it. And similar, this green, really quite small chromosome existed in the ancestor, but it's fused here uh, onto this chromosome, Brentis Eno, and onto this chromosome, Brentis Daphne. And so what we can now do is ask, well, if they, if these butterflies, uh, if the population split in two, and then they exchange migrants between the two populations early on in the speciation uh, process, then maybe exchanging migrants gene flow happen more on these chromosomes than on these rearranged ones. And that's because a hybrid individual might be heterozygous, so these very complex rearrangements might have lower fitness. And so by resequencing more genomes, just using standard Illumina uh, whole genome sequencing, and then we can look at the mutations in our sample and we can fit a model where we try and estimate this ME parameter, which is a gene flow parameter, is the effective rate of migration. And in, in other words, or in summary, we find that on these non-rearranged chromosomes, there's a history of exchanging genes between the two populations. But on these rearranged chromosomes, generally we find that actually gene flow is reduced. And that's probably due to underdominance, so heterozygote disadvantage in hybrids. And so what we've learned just by comparing these two genomes and doing a bit of extra population genomics analyses is that these chromosome rearrangements seem to be really quite important for speciation in the genus. And with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors in Edinburgh, Conrad Lozer and Simon Martin, the other members, the Lozer and Martin Labs, and also other collaborators. I'd like to thank you all very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. That was um, a really great introduction to your research and absolutely fascinating how um, you're able to study speciation with these um, great genomes that you've developed. Okay, so um, our first question, and I know that each of you shared a little bit about this, but I'm hoping you can pinpoint, um, what are you most excited about um, when you think about utilizing all of these chromosome scale assemblies that are now available out in the world. Um, and how do you see that changing, you know, from now to the next five years and then 10 years on? And Alex, since you spoke last, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I think what I'm quite excited about, and I think it's already starting to happen, uh, especially with model systems and soon non-model systems, is yeah, very, very good assemblies for multiple individuals, as I think if you're interested in population level processes like adaptation uh, or speciation, as I mentioned, having yeah, great assemblies for
for multiple individuals that are really quite closely related, um, I think you can do a lot. Um, so it, it's not common now, but I think it will be very soon. For sure. Shilpa, did you want to go? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm excited about, like, as Alex said, like the routine production, when this will, like, we can produce root chromosome scale genomes combined, including the algorithms and sequencing technology, like maybe in a few hours. So I'm, I'm excited about, uh, like, having genomes at scale. And in the area of human health, and like, because if you want to study these long range interactions, these are possible only by utilizing HiC for um, uh, some, and also in the space of plants, like plant cells are very important for sustainable food production, climate change era. So, and plants are massive, there are many haplotypes. I think that can be solved only through HiC. And I'm very much fascinated see the advances in the technology and it's already become possible. Yeah, for sure. Wonderful. Julio? Yeah, so I, what, what I think it's uh, really happening now um, and wasn't possible until recently, thanks to uh, technologists such as Arima, is that we can really sample the tree of life uh, densely so we can generate a representation of the tree of life that is, uh, you know, in breath and in uh, deepness is really, really uh, good. So as, uh, you know, the projects that I mentioned before progress uh, under the Earth Vision um, uh, Project Umbrella, we will have a very, very uh, accurate picture uh, of, uh, of life. And I think that um, answers or will help us answer one of the most uh, uh, interesting questions for biologists that is, uh, uh, you know, the origins of life and the evolution uh, of, uh, of life on Earth. Definitely. Yeah, well, once we uh, crack that, what more will there be to study, really? Um, but yeah, that's super exciting that that's even um, a possibility with all these genomes that are available. Okay, for our next question, um, and I think we, we just sort of talked about it, but um, Shilpa, you spoke about pan genomes and you're working closely with the um, human pan gene um, project. Is pan genomics the future for all species? Do we need um, to do pan genomics for all species or um, are a couple genomes sufficient um, for some species and then doing pan genomics for other species um, more relevant? Yeah. Shilpa, do you want to start? Sure, that's a good question. So. I think we need pan genomes for like some dense pan genomes for every species. And then there is a broader level pan genome that keeps some form of associations. It's like, for example, like humans are divergent from chimpanzees and so on. So if we want to have like how study across species, then we have some broader level. Of, but I think pan genomics is the way to go for the near future. And with these advancements, it's becoming possible. For sure, wonderful. Alex, Julio, any thoughts on pan genomics? I think, yeah, I'll go ahead if that's okay. So, yeah. um, I think, well, one thing I'm, yeah, I would be interested uh, to learn more about this, but I already know that in, for example, the butterflies I'm working on, heterozygosity and so populate, effective population size is large. And so if you sample two individuals at random in the population, they really are genetically quite different from one another. And so you can just tell if you have samples there across Europe, that the further away you get from your reference, slowly but surely, just less reads map. And so mm. I think because, you know, for it's sad that you're throwing away all this fantastic uh, information in your data, that that, yeah, hopefully can be remedied by some beautiful pangenome reference. I would add that um, I think we, we have to agree on what uh, we define as uh, pangenomes first, because 
the idea of pangenomes itself, uh, um, you know, it's not new, but it's also in the, the, the way we uh, consider it now is re re relatively uh, novel. You know, for a long time, it was uh, essentially something used to describe uh, metagenomic communities. So uh, now there is a, you know, a new idea that is uh, spearheaded by the um, uh, Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, for instance, you know, that is trying to generate a pangenome for uh, for human that could eventually replace uh, a linear reference that we're used to, you know, the GRC um, reference. Uh, and um, in that sense, if it's a, a, a different way of representing uh, genetic variation in a species, I think it's, uh, uh, and as it seems to be a, a more effective way of representing genetic variation within species, I think we need pan genomes for all species. Now we are just going to be um, uh, in a better position to uh, address biological questions. Uh, and I think that's that's achievable in, in this sense, you know, that we actually are trying to think about different ways of um, re uh, representing and understanding genetic variation. Okay, um, and I, th I think that leads into my next question. So for you, Julio, um, you think a lot about scalability and of course, um, Pan genomics would involve lots of scale um, and the challenges that come along with scale. But um, can you talk a little bit about what some of your favorite tools are these days to use um, in your pipeline? And um, you know what areas you see as needing improvement in these tools um, so that developers like Shilpa can work on them to help us all extract more uh, you know, biological insights from genomic data more readily, since not everyone is a bioinformatician out there. So I, I really, I think I already responded to the first question and is also now in the pool because the, I mean, I've mentioned SALS and YAS uh, and IFASM, uh, but I will uh, answer the, the question on the challenges that you mentioned, uh, particularly when it comes to pangenomics. I mean, now pangenomics is a very powerful idea uh, and we're starting to have uh, means to generate uh, these representation of genomes that I was referring to. Uh, at the same time, uh, this um, you know is a completely different uh, paradigm, and, and that implies that we need uh, essentially completely new tools, or at least that we have to re-engineer all the tools that uh, people are familiar with uh, to conduct you know population uh, genetic studies. Uh, uh, for phylogenomics and so forth. So I, I think it will take, uh, you know, the next uh, years, next uh, few generations of, um, of developers to get to the point that we can actually take advantage of uh, pangenomes uh, for, um, in the same way, at least that we used to, um, I mean, or you, we're actually still used to, um, uh, to do our, um, our research. Uh, and so I would say this is, uh, you know, what I will ask uh, to Shilpa and, uh, and many others who are uh, currently working on these problems. Now, we need these tools to become available so that actually we can uh, smooth the transition. Shilpa, do you agree? Yes, thanks for your inputs. I totally agree to this. Like, we need a whole ecosystem of new tools. That, uh, that can all work in the pan-genomic space. And that too, at the chromosome level, like the initial tools, for example, in the pan-genomic initial tools were, some of them were reference-based in the pan-genomic area, like PG, not PG, sorry, many graph, uh, but now going, if you wanna completely remove the reference bias, then like there is a whole new ecosystem to perform like even structure variation calling, mapping, some basic bioinformatics. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, Alex, this question's for you. So um, using the tools that you had available today, um, on the more biology, using genomes um, to understand biology side of it, how like, was it difficult for you to um, work with a chromosome scale assembly? And are there questions that you were able to answer with the chromosome scale assembly that you don't think you would have been able to uh, with a, simply a draft genome? Yes, so everything, what I would just say is that 
yeah, once you have that first kind of high C map, if, if what you're focused on is chromosome rearrangements, um, then once you have a high C map, everything does become much, much clearer, I think. Um, and of course, it's it's hard to, and I did do this for you know some weeks, like you, it's very tempting to, when you have a draft assembly, like, well, I'm still going to try and figure it out. I'm still going to try and work out what is fused and what is inverted and where things are, but it, it is really tricky. Um, and so I think it is, yeah, it is very useful or yeah, much, much easier when um, everything is scaffolded together. And I gave, a, I gave a talk a couple of years ago where I presented a first draft genome and said about all of these rearrangements. And the obvious question um, was, well, couldn't this, couldn't this just be misassembly? And mm -hmm. of course it's not all just misassembly, but there are misassemblies in there. Um, and so, for these projects, I've used PacBio CLR data, which is a which is noisier than HiFi data. But I know that even with really accurate reads, uh, assemblers can still make mistakes. And so, yeah, I think that the two things that do make a big difference is going from complex to chromosomes, but also getting rid of um, deceiving joins in your initial assembly. And Julia, I'll just rephrase the question for you. Um, since I imagine that you work with, like as a lead um, bioinformatician for the VGP, you work with a lot of biologists who may be, you know, an expert in the frog species they want the genome for, but not necessarily a bioinformatician. So how are you feeling about the tools being accessible um, for doing all this great biology that we know um, genome assemblies provide a foundation for? First of all, I would say that um, if anyone in the audience ever worked with, uh, you know, in Lumina based assemblies that didn't have scaffold information, I'm sure they can appreciate that, uh, you know, in the, in the space of a few years, we went from something that was very uh, hard to deal with, you know, like thousands of small fragments to be reconciled uh, in some way, you know, to be able to, you know, do the biology. Uh, analysis um, downstream to something that uh, you know because of long reads uh, for sure, but also because of high high C scaffolding technologies, it's now really capable of generating almost uh, I, would, I would call them now telomere to telomere assemblies, so that basically span the whole. Um, a chromosome uh, with very few gaps in between, and I think that's a first step uh, towards um, uh, allowing biologists to really take advantage of these uh, genomes. Because before then, again, uh, the tools were much more complicated. Now, if you have a, you know, just a few pieces to look at, actually, it makes it so much easier for anyone to understand what they're dealing with. Uh, while if you have thousands of pieces, uh, which is still the case, actually, if you have only uh, long reads at this point uh, of, uh, let's say, hi-fi reads or uh, nanopore reads, uh, you know, you still get a highly fermented genome, uh, much better than a few years ago, but still highly fermented. So having, you know, chromosomes to look at is, a, it makes it much, much easier for, for biologists to, to actually uh, take advantage of the availability of these genomes. And, um, and we, we in the VGP, we have a, you know, a significant commitment to try to make things easier. Uh, when I was uh, ex um, uh, presenting before, I, I was showing that our pipeline is actually um, in this uh, uh, computational infrastructure called Galaxy that is public and allows you to run from a graphical interface uh, your assembly. But also, it actually allows you to use, then use these assemblies to run a whole suite of um, analyses that are, you know, uh, popular in the in the um, uh, biological space. So uh, I think we're going in this direction of trying to uh, simplify the process as much as possible. And I would just mention that uh, with pangenomics uh, sort of arising, we need to take that into consideration as well. I mean, we we want to make better representation of things so, so that are easier for people. Uh, to use and understand, uh, so that will also take an effort. Sure, wonderful. And Shilpa, um, you know, you showed in your presentation how you're using um, the sort of hierarchical structure um, and the graph-based approach. Anything that you see as going to be coming in the future to help make uh, genomic data sort of more accessible uh, to scientists around the world? Uh, yes. So we generally make these tools openly available 
as biologists, as evolutionists, anyone who speaks to you. Um, and they're generally on GitHub. Uh, and also these tools, they are in, like initially tested on a few genomes and then so we are a part of few consortiums. For example, there are large scale international initiatives that, that, that are sequencing like hundreds to thousands to hopefully millions one day. So we try to like tune these tools to the latest technology and make them uh, openly available to be accessible for the wide world. Okay, great. Um, but that I guess that means we all have the challenge of staying up to date on the latest technologies, yes. which in sequencing seems um, to be changing Definitely. all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's a fun part of the game. Yes, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, well, we are at eight minutes past the hour, so um, we will end the panel discussion there. I want to give a big thank you to our panelists um, for talking to us about all things genome assembly today and your outstanding work in the field. As a reminder, we do have this grant opportunity open until October 14th. You are welcome to apply anytime before then. And with that, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. And as always, you can learn more about ARIMA High C on our website. Thank you.